Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. This is episode number 233. Coming up, four budget folders in the offing from Damn Designs, a couple of oldies but goodies in the state of the collection, and we take a look at folding knife lock types. Uh, remember, if you want to get show notes and other information on this episode, you can go to the knifejunkie.com slash 233. Okay, my first opportunity to show off a knife here, and of course, it's always more than one knife. That's right, it's the pocket check. Now today, one in the pocket, one on the belt. First in the pocket is the Goliath and intimidating and extremely useful and utilitarian and gorgeous off-grid knives, Enforcer XL. I've been talking a lot about off-grid recently. I got a, a uh, mother load of off-grid knives in here. I got four recently and I'm just digging them. And this one right here is, I'm about to say it's my favorite, but it's it's hard to say. Uh, this This blade shape just sings to me. Now, I have admitted in recent days that I at least understand why people call it a reverse tanto. Not that I condone uh, such uh, such naming of this blade shape, uh, but this is a curved worn cliff, or uh, a <laughs> well, we'll just we'll just call it that. But the thing I love about this is, you know, I'm my wheelhouse is three and a half to four inches, and this is damn near four inches on the nose. Uh, it is a really, really nice and large knife. Um, it's got a bit of weight behind it, but if you look down here in the uh, liners, you can see how skeletonized those liners are. You see those big, giant, weight-relieving uh, holes cut out of the liners. So I, I think it's just on mass. And, and look, even on the even on the liner lock side, you can see they they pulled out quite a bit of steel there. Uh, so it's basically on the mass of the blade and just the size of the thing. These are these are heavily sculpted G10 handles with uh, upward protruding diamonds or not diamonds pyramids. Uh, so instead of having um, having the texture milled down into the surface of the G10, uh, there's a lot of G10 removed to create this field of pyramids. So uh, very nice gription on this knife. The one thing I haven't done with this yet is sand down this side, which I really have to do because th this is a pocket destroyer as, uh, as most um, aggressively textured G10 is. So I'm going to sand out a little bit right around here. That's what I do with every new Emerson and every new cold steel knife I get. I just sand it down on the clip side so that when I Put the clip in and pull it out. It's not just, you know, snagging and destroying my already uh, compromised um, pocket hems, you know. So, um, but this is what I'm carrying today. It's got a very nice and uh, quite, you know, protruding, um, what do you call that? Glass breaker, which is removable, I'm told. I haven't done it yet. Um, and I'm thinking of doing that, even though that will... Um, take away part of the utility of this knife because I really, really like the shape of this pommel. It looks perfect for capping with the thumb in a reverse grip. Um, so I have to, <clears throat> I have to sort of weigh what makes more sense. Am I more likely to use the glass breaker or am I more likely to use this in a reverse grip? Hopefully neither situation where those uh, are necessary pops up in my life because that means the day has gone wrong. Uh, but in case it does, I have the off-grid knives um, Enforcer XL in my pocket. We also, uh, if you like this knife, you can get it with an affiliate link. Uh, you can just go to the knifejunkie.com slash off-grid and it will take you to the site and you can buy it that way. And a small portion of your purchase uh, comes back to us. So that's a that's a nice little deal that carry over at Off Grid offered us. And of course, I snapped it up. Uh, next, riding on my belt <clears throat> in the 12 o'clock position, which is rare for me. Uh, there's only one other knife that I carry in the 12 o'clock position, and that is my Steingraber Performance Knives Shark. Uh, but this one I carry horizontally 
and uh, at 12 o'clock. And it is, of course, my somewhat re recently purchased, it was my spring 2021 purchase, uh, the Bastinelli Anomaly. This is part of a four knife group of collaborations between Bastion Cove and Doug Markaida, the famous Kali man who, who appears on uh, um, Forged in Fire. Uh, he is pretty outstanding. I mean, his skills, if it, I've been following him for a long time. And uh, except for one little, you know, martial arts controversy where he made a controversial statement about footwork, uh, I've been on board with Doug Markaida for a long time and I'm and, and really impressed by his, uh, not only his philosophy, but his, his raw skill is amazing. <clears throat> so he got together with Bastion Cove and uh, they, he's, which he has a number of times on a number of other knives, but this four knife series uh, features the same handle, uh, mine is custom, so I got this nice burgundy wrap on there, but uh, four different blade shapes. And this was the most compelling to me. It's that Pical style tip down edge in, um, sort of Elvia, sort of fruit knife style, uh, so that when you have it in hand, you can use it uh, in this sort of gross motor motion, and it's like a cat's claw. Uh, a lot of people refer to um, um, uh, uh, the karambit as sort of a an animal claw thing, but as um, as as was mentioned on the on the podcast here, uh, no animal has outward pointing claws and no animal sort of does this motion with their claws. Uh, that was uh, Ed Calderon's note. Uh, it's, it's always pulling in and drawing in, down and in. So um, this really optimizes the gross motor motion you're likely to, uh, you're only going to have during a, an altercation where you actually need to draw a knife and use it. Chances are all of your fancy techniques will go out the door and you'll you'll turn into a caveman. So this this really does take care of those caveman uh, instincts. And for me, it's a thing of beauty and I just like to have it on my person so I can admire it from time to time. So today's knives uh, in the pocket are the uh, is is the off grid knives XL Enforcer, a beautiful bellied worn cliff blade and uh and on the belt today in the 12 o'clock position horizontally is the bastinelli anomaly um so coming up tomorrow night right here on thursday night knives is the gentleman junkie giveaway gentleman junkie is the highest tier of support on our uh, patreon page and uh, we feature a knife giveaway to those folks who uh, generously uh, help support the show now, that doesn't mean we don't value our supporters at the $5 level, the tactical junkies, and the $3 level, those are the traditional junkies. Uh, but, you know, it's the main perk of being at the highest tier. Uh, so tomorrow night is our monthly knife giveaway. That's always the third Thursday of the month. And I want to show you the knife uh, that we're giving away. This was very generously bequeathed to the channel by our good friend Dave over at This Old Blade Knife Reviews. Check out Dave's reviews. He's got awesome taste in knives um, that are very, uh, they sort of resonate with me. He's got sort of a tactical uh, sort of edge to him. Do you see what I did there with edge? And he has a long, long history of Filipino martial arts and Kali. He's trained with some of the best for years and years, which makes him some of the best. Uh, so here we go. He has given us this um, Steel Will Arcturus. This was a 2020 uh, release. Just a beautiful clip point modified. I'm going to call this a modified clip point. You know, sometimes I hesitate to use the term modified in front of something, a blade shape, because each blade shape is different from the other. It's always going to be modified. But this is definitely evocative of a clip point knife, uh, except it puts the point of the blade uh, right in line with the center line. And uh, well, to me, that makes it less upswept and more um, daggerish in the presentation of the point. Um, yet you have a clip up here and a tiny, tiny swedge and this awesome place to put your thumb if you're really uh, going to town on this thing. So uh, if you look at the edge profile, it is a full bellied blade and nearly four inches. Well, it's a, it's about 3.8 inches long, 3.75 inches long. And uh, it's made of D2 steel. 
excuse me, and uh, G10 handles. One thing I like a lot about this is that uh, the lock side has a has a pretty much full steel frame nestled within the uh, a, a pocket milled into this G10, and the other side is almost liner less. There's just a little bit around the pivot there uh, to to give it strength at the pivot point. Um, other than that, it's uh, it's linerless on the show side, which makes the knife nice and light. I mean, it's a big knife but it's slender and it's damn light, I gotta say. Uh, in saber position, saber grip here, it is extremely comfortable. And then also Filipino grip, if you're kind of reaching up with your thumb to do this sort of push cut work, it is also very comfortable. And uh, not for nothing in reverse grip, it's no slouch. And then look at that beautiful clip. I really like this clip. It's not deep carry, but it, it'll do until deep carry gets here. Let me put it that way. Uh, it is, it, only a tiny little portion of the knife pops up. So uh, I'm not trying to sell this knife. I'm trying to give this knife away. Uh, so be a gentleman junkie. Uh, join us on uh, on uh, uh, Patreon. And uh, well, as I usually say, see what helping us gets you. And in this case, uh, it will be this Steel Will Arcturus knife for the month of July, 2021. And uh, your chances of winning are still pretty pretty good. We have a growing roster of patrons, but uh, you know, if you look at it on an odds type of level, uh, well, you're, you still have pretty good odds. So uh, check it out. Thursday night knives, tomorrow night. Uh, Jim will craft a, a, a wheel of destiny. We will spin that wheel and wherever it lands, by the way, it's totally random. It's from a, a certified randomized website. Um, but it just looks cool because it's on a spinning wheel and, uh, and we'll see who gets it. All right. A friend in need is a friend indeed with a grip of steel that makes you feel you're not in this world alone. That's something my grandfather, my grandpa Tignorelli used to say, and we had a handshake that went along with it. And, uh, you know, he's a man from a bygone era, uh, born in 1908, uh, and passed away, unfortunately. Uh, or fortunately for him, I guess. Uh, but what I'm trying to get at is some things don't change, and that is helping friends in need. And a good friend of the channel and a and just a, a sterling knife guy out in the YouTube knife community, uh, John Robbins, he needs a little bit of help from us right now. Uh, you know John Robbins as Grateful Panic. He's a really awesome, good-natured guy who does great knife, rev knife reviews and live streams. And uh, he's hit a rough patch, you know, he's, he's fallen on some hard times. His, uh, he, he was kind of unexpectedly laid off by some unscrupulous employers. There's a whole story behind it you can check out. I'm not going to go into it here, but uh, it sounds like some dishonesty happening. And, and he and his daughter are the, uh, are the victims of it. And uh, he needs a little help getting over the hump and getting himself uh, back on his feet. So if you have the means and you have the gumption, uh, go to GoFundMe and search John Robbins and, um, you know, send him what you can and 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 help a guy out. Uh, I know he would do the same. Uh, we've had a couple of little conversations offline, um, you know, over the past few months. And and he's just uh, he's a really nice guy. He's a great guy. And uh, he's supporting his daughter. And that that strums a chord with me. Uh, I often I've imagined often when thinking about how good I've ha I have it. I think about how things could go south and how things could go wrong. And I sometimes think of how horrible it would be to have to, I shouldn't say horrible, but how, how stressful and hard it would be to have to support my daughters on my own and not have, you know, my wife with me to do that. And um, anyway, I'm, I'm going too far. Let me just say, let's try and help John Robbins. Grateful panic. Go to GoFundMe, search John Robbins and help him out. All right, so coming up, we're going to talk about uh, some new budget uh, offerings in the offing. I, I'm going to say high value instead of budget. Budget has sort of a mm, has a little twang to it that I don't like. We're going to call it high value uh, from Damn Designs. But first, let's talk Thursday Night Knives. You know our weekly live stream features drop-in guests. Recently, we've had Doug Ritter. We've had Carrie from Off Grid Knives. We've had Ben from Jack Wolf quite a lot. And... Uh, Last week, we had fledgling knife maker Scott Stills come on and show his latest creation, a beautiful uh, frame lock folder. 
uh, second one out of the gate and he's doing awesome. So we have a lot of drop in guests, but did you know that you could join the conversation too? Just go to the knifejunkie.com slash join, aim your camera at yourself and hop on the show with us. You can stay a while and chat and, and get into the, the meat and potatoes with us, or you can just say hi. It doesn't matter. Either way, I would love to meet you. You also know that Thursday Night Knives goes live on YouTube every Thursday night at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. But did you know we are also live on Facebook and Twitch? That's right, Facebook and Twitch. Well, now you do. So check out Thursday Night Knives live 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and join the conversation and meet me in person. That's a air quotes person. That's Thursday Night Knives, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, live on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. You're listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast, and now here's the Knife Junkie with the Knife Life News. Damned Designs, some very cool and unique knives uh, that have been out mm, in the last, I don't know, two years has he been doing it? Um, I have, uh, well, I've, I've been checking out this uh, recent article. I know I have a couple of knives uh, from one of the pass around groups, uh, Peter's pass around group on the way. But anyway, uh, Dam Designs, Adrian D'Souza is the man behind uh, Dam Designs. And he came out of the gate with a couple of high end designs and they're unique. Um, it, I say high end because they were in carbon fiber and M390 and such, but uh, you know, those were three early models, but he wants to break in a little deeper into the knife world. And he's decided that the best way to do so is to make his work a little bit more affordable. And then, and then down the pike a little bit, he'll come back out with some more, um, you know, high end stuff. So he's got these four designs, uh, that have been made public and they're all named after, um, uh, sort of multicultural, uh, uh, supernatural entities. Uh, one's called the Banshee, one's called the Basilisk, one's called the Wendigo, and one called the one's called the Yokai. So we have Japanese, we have um, Native American. I don't know where the Basilisk is from. Maybe Great Britain, and the Banshee. And uh, they're really, really cool designs. Now, what I like about them most is that they are in. Um, even though their budget, uh, they're coming out in a high value format, a more affordable format. And by affordable, he means sub $50, which is pretty amazing. What I still love about them is that they have G10, they're going to have G10 handle scales and 14C28N, the Swedish Sandvik blade steel that, I mean, it's been around a long time and it is tried and true. It is a great blade steel. No, it's not powder metallurgy. It's still in, uh, you know, ingot steel, but it is a it is a pretty pretty great uh, budget steel. It's probably my favorite. Uh, I also like D two, but it is probably one of my favorites. Uh, so this blade line, uh, this knife line. The other thing I really like about it is that they're all somewhat biggish. Three point six inches for the Banshee. Um, my favorite of the bunch, the Basilisk, which looks a lot like the Cerberus, uh, an earlier design of his. 3.8 inches. It is a big boy. And uh, not not for nothing, it is a, a menacing design at that. The Wendigo, named after the, what is it, the Native American deer spirit uh, sort of haunting thing. Uh, 3.6 inches, an interesting looking tanto with, a, with a, something that looks a bit to me like a diamond shaped cross section at the tip with that swedge. And then uh, looking a lot like the Banshee, but in a more tant American Tanto format, is the Yokai. Um, <laughs> and if you if you follow uh, uh, Knife News, uh, Ben there over there describes it as the Tantoiest of the Tantos on display here, which I love. Also at three point eight five inches, which is man, I just love that. I love that he's doing uh, that. That D'Souza is making these in this large format. That's that's my absolute favorite. At the end of the article, he mentions uh, in the future, you know, after people have had a chance to digest these more high value uh, knives, he's going to come back out with with the um, with the higher end knives with higher end st blade steels and handle materials and also some XL versions, which 
totally gets me excited because we're talking about 3.8 inch blades already. So if you're talking XL, we're talking over four inches at least. So who knows, man, maybe, maybe he'll be coming out to compete with cold steel in their uh, sort of not sort of cold steel in their XL uh, knives. And, uh, and I don't know, the only other people doing that right now are, is Kershaw, I think with their, with their strata XL. So very much looking forward to getting these uh, these inexpensive damned designs, these damn designs, looking forward to getting them in hand, especially, like I said, the uh, the yokai and the um, basilisk. So cool. So cool. So looking forward to that. Adrian D'Souza. I'm also looking forward to getting uh, the knives from the pass around group uh, in hand. Uh, just incidentally, uh, I didn't think to mention this until right now, but I, I have this crisp bladed uh, cold steel in front of me. And uh, this is the, the Voyager. Uh, it just reminds me this past weekend, I watched a movie with my girls that they love. They're like, dad, you have to see this. You have to see it. It's called Raya and the Magic Dragon. It's a, I think it's Disney. Disney, I don't know, all these companies. It's, uh, but it is, I think it's a Disney. And, and uh, it's about a girl who's, saves uh, an imaginary world uh, post-apocalyptic brings back the dragons and all this and it unites the people very cool movie but something i really liked about it was the weapons design and the fight choreography obviously whoever did the animated fight choreography has uh, trained in filipino martial arts or knows their stuff in 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 that realm but I gotta say, something I always bristle at is weapons design, bladed weapons design in fantasy movies and, and in movies in general. And man, did they nail it. The, the, the blades in this, even the spears in this movie are so cool. So if you like uh, you know, good action and uh, it's feel good Disney action, um, but man, if you wanna see some great animated weapons design, check out Raya and the Magic Dragon. Hey, I should, I should, uh, I should send this to Disney. Maybe I'll get some, some of that Disney money uh, flowing in here. Likely not, though. Anyway, uh, still to come, we're going to take a, a look at the um, uh, state of the collection, and we're also going to take a look at some folding knife lock types. But before we do, do you drive to work? Do you mow the lawn or wash the dishes? Then check out the Knife Junkie audio podcast on your favorite podcatcher. Our RSS feed issues, which were plaguing us for quite some time, have been resolved once and for all. And each week now you can check out the updated supplemental shows and, your, uh, and, and the interview shows on your favorite podcast apps. We're on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeart, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, Pandora, and the list goes on and on. We're there every week now, and Jim and I are furiously checking the updates every Monday and Sunday to make sure that they're coming through, and they are. And I am thrilled because that's how it all started. So take it back to the beginning and learn about knives while you're doing the boring stuff you have to do. Check out the Knife Junkie Podcast Audio Edition. That's the Knife Junkie Audio Podcast on your favorite podcast players. Looking for a new knife? How about one from Benchmade, Spyderco, We, or Bark River? Get that new knife and support the Knife Junkie channel, and save money on a new knife all at the same time. Visit our Knives for Sale page at www.thenifejunkie.com slash knives for this week's specials. Through our affiliate relationships, we bring you weekly knife specials on great knives. You save some money on your knife purchase, and the Knife Junkie channel makes a small commission, it's a win-win. Check out the new knife specials each and every week at www.thenifejunkie.com slash knives. That's thenifejunkie.com slash knives. Oh, hi. I didn't see you there. Um, so now that we're back, uh, I want to show you some, uh, this is the state of the collection. I want to show you some oldies but goodies. Um, I've had a furious flow of new uh, knives and implements of chaos coming through. Uh, recently, but this past week, I've had to take a chill pill. Now I'm going to have to do that for a few weeks just to recoup. You know, I went uh, went a little nuts at Blade Show, or more nuts than expected. And before Blade Show, I had some things, some irons in the fire that came through that had to be paid for. So I'm I'm just sort of enjoying what I have, 
and uh, and just kind of easing up on the on the uh, purchasing uh, for for the moment, just for the moment. Um, but uh, so I wanted to talk about a couple of uh, oldies but goodies. But before I do, I, I also want to mention uh, Matt Chase from Hogtooth Knives has been sending me updates on my uh, 50th birthday knife. <clears throat> which is uh, being very uh, generously funded by my parents who are just proud to see I made it to 50. And uh, man alive, Matt Chase, man, I, I, I know from his other work that he makes beautiful knives and that's why I commissioned this from him. But oh my God, he's going above and beyond. He's made the most beautiful uh, uh, Damascus patterned, um, it's a sub hilt fighter in the style of the loveless bob loveless big bear you know so check that out if you if you need to know what that knife pattern looks like look, you know just look it up it's the loveless sub hilt fighter with a seven inch double edge clip point blade and um he made this amazing um uh, uh, uh what do you call it uh pattern weld damascus steel it is so gorgeous and now the blade is ground out and now he's working on the handle, which will be stag and wrought iron. I, I, I cannot wait. And I will show you updates um, when it's finished. And I'm going to have Matt back on the show to talk about the build process and such. But um, I'm so excited. I cannot wait until that knife is in the state of the collection. But it is not yet. But what I do have are two other clip point blades that I would just want to show off uh, briefly. The first one is, you know, I just had that cold steel Chris up. Well, the first Cold Steel Voyager I ever got was this little honey. And it's not so little. This is uh, the five inch Cold Steel Voyager in Bowie blade. Now this is a, a hollow ground blade. And for a long time, it was without a doubt my sharpest knife. And it still is extremely sharp. Uh, came out of the box extremely sharp. And you know, I bring this out from time to time and I talk about where I got it. There's this fantasy land, uh, which was once New York City, um, called Times Square. And Times Square used to have, you know, before it was, uh, uh, you know, Red Lobster and ESPN Zone and, you know, Disney Store and whatever else is there, Legoland. Um, it used to have a place called Roseland Martial Arts, was a, which was a giant, deep, martial arts store that had a an acre long knife cabinet i mean it was uh it was at least 50 feet long and it started with the good stuff and it tapered down to the to the gas station knives but the point is they had everything at least at the time uh in terms of production knives and they had a, a banging cold steel section they had every cold steel that was on the market at the time and i went in there once with i know i was looking for something else I, I can't, I think I was looking for the Desperado, that uh, egg shape handled fixed blade with the Vaquero, the five inch serrated Vaquero blade that someone mentioned on the last Thursday Night Knives they'd love to see come out of retirement. And I couldn't agree more. And they didn't have it. And I think I had money burning a hole in my pocket and I bought this. So yeah, you could at one point walk into a store in New York City and walk out with this. This is five inches and just a just a beautiful, beautiful knife, beautifully ground. And uh, I love the handle. The handle uh, always reminded me of the classic. Um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Navaja from Spain. I, I just love that curved sort of horn shaped handle. Of course, it's shaped that way to accommodate this large blade and the curve there. And um, it also allows you some, some extra reach with an angle that presents the blade uh, at, at, a, at a great sort of aggressive chopping angle. Of course, I, as you can see, have, you know, I retrofitted it with some skateboard tape because um, there's not much in the way of stopping you from sliding up onto that blade. There's a little bit here in, in the shape of the handle and the contour of the handle. Uh, but one thing I wanna mention about this, uh, you know, the triad lock, Andrew Demko's um, folding lock back masterpiece uh, really has stolen the news over the past 11, 12 years with cold steel. But before there was the triad lock, there was just the regular cold steel back lock, which was nothing to sneeze at. I mean, this is no slouch. Uh, this mid 
mid spine lockback was really really strong, and so they they took a great and very strong lockback, and then uh, through Andrew Demko's uh, lock design, which we're going to unpack a little bit uh, coming up here, they they took it the extra uh, extra mile. But but even before the triad lock, Cold Steel was making some incredibly stout folding knives, and this Voyager um, five inch, I just wanted to bust out and uh, give props because we're going to be talking about lock knife locking knives later, and uh, this would this would be an also ran. I got to say. Just a, just a beautiful knife. Uh, the other one I just want to briefly mention, and the reason this popped into my mind is that I had a viewer send me some pictures of, of family heirlooms. This is the Buck 119. And uh, the viewer sent in pictures of his 119 that uh, came to him through his father. His father carried one in Vietnam, and uh, I think I think it ended up breaking, and he replaced it with a Randall. Uh, but in any case, what a great knife this is! This was a gift to me for a birthday. I think it was my forty-sixth birthday. A uh, one of my wife's cousin's husband uh, bought this for me, and it was totally unexpected. And I was so excited because this is one of those knives that I used to look at in the knife cabinets of the hardware store or of uh, Remington Knives when that was a thing in the Randall Park Mall in the uh, outskirts of Cleveland, Ohio. Um, this was one of those knives, that that aggressive clip point blade and that really high grind. I mean, I just, you can just intuitively tell with that hollow grind and that high, uh, high cutting edge that this is just a wickedly sharp knife. And it is, it is. Look at that profile too, just a classic. They have recently come out with S35 VN versions with um, OD green micarta handles, which I would love to get my hands on. Uh, it's just not on my short list right now, but it's on my long list, we'll say. Um, one thing about this knife that has always been a little curious to me is how chunky wide this handle is. I mean, it is a really, really thick handle and, and the thickness comes all the way up to the guard. That's almost an inch thick. Um, so I, I was always a little bit curious about that, not having the most giant hands in the world. I always thought, hmm, this knife is thick. But you know what? Over time, I've really gotten to like the way it feels in hand. And it makes sense, uh, seeing that this is primarily a hunting knife. It seems to make sense to me that with the sort of slick Delrin style material or whatever this is, it's some sort of poly material, uh, that you would want wide, a wide handle on a, um, on a hunting knife because you might get, it might get wet. You might get blood or viscera on it while you're using it. So any extra bit of grip helps. Plus you've got that little finger choil up there. Uh, so it does, it does add for comfort. Now that finger choil is not that big. And if you've got big sausage fingers, actually it's probably not big enough at all, but long and short of it is I really, really appreciate this classic. I also appreciate that Buck has updated it with uh, different materials, uh, but seeing that it served in Vietnam, you know, with, uh, with a, a viewer's father, uh, I don't know. It just sort of restoked my interest in this knife. And uh, thanks for sharing that, sir. But so here you have it. It's the Buck 119, a, an oldie, but a goodie. Don't forget about the Bucks. So now uh, I want to talk about um, knife locks. And the first one we talk about is going to be a buck, believe it or not. And that is the back lock. The back lock, one of the first locking knife types. Now, you might say, Bob, that's the first knife lock. Well, I, I might say no, the liner lock, because there are a number of traditional knives like the, um, you know, like the electrician's knife or some others that have that liner lock with the protruding lock. I don't have one of those. Uh, well, I have a, I do have an electrician's knife, but I didn't pull it out for this. First lock we're gonna talk about here is the lock back. And uh, this is the classic Buck 110. So I figured I'd show it here. Now, how this works is it's a hinged leaf. There's a spring in there. It's a, a leaf spring. And when you press it down, the lock comes up and here, let me get my hand behind there. 
And the notch on the end of this uh, lock, well, let's see, let me put it this way. There's a little uh, downward facing tab on the end of this uh, lock bar here, and it fits into the little notch on the back of the blade tang. Very strong lock. Um, and when it's open, the tang of the blade nestles right up against the end of this leaf here, this lock bar. I'm sorry, it's a lock bar, not a leaf. The leaf is the spring inside. Now I'm gonna show you a variation of this, which I mentioned earlier, the triad lock. Now how the triad lock makes this um, back lock so much stronger is by adding a uh, stop pin between the tang of the blade and the lock bar here. So it works basically the same, basically I should say, um, except you don't have the tang of the blade coming up right against the lock bar. You have it stopping against this stop pin. But when you push the lock bar in, you'll see that you still have a notch on the tang of the blade and you still have a tab on the end of the lock bar and they still fit in together. However, it's a much deeper engagement there and it's also set up to, um, over time, settle into the lock deeper and deeper uh, with wear. So it's kind of always getting stronger and uh, always main, always um, maintaining a um, an, an, an ever more engaged uh, lock up there. But what that blade stop does is it absorbs all the shock that might be coming in through the blade, especially in this direction, and absorbs it into the lock, uh, in, into the stop pin and into the frame of the knife, not into the lock itself. And that's where most failures of, uh, of back locks will occur. And I've had that happen with uh, Spyderco back locks, my Endura. So definitely an innovation on an old design. And uh, you're gonna see Andrew Demko pop up in this conversation a couple of times here because that man is a, is a genius with the locks and uh, has created quite a, quite a number of them. So the first lock here is the back lock. Second is the liner lock, which I mentioned earlier. Now liner locks, here I'm gonna show it off on this Super CQC 15 from Emerson. Uh, liner lock is also a very old lock. Like I said, um, you can find it in um, the, on the screwdriver tool of the old electrician's folding knives. And, uh, and then on some other um, kind of traditional knives, you'll see it and it'll have a big protruding tab, which totally gets in the way. I don't, I'm not sure why they didn't think to cut away uh, like we do on the modern, um, modern liner locks. But so here, what this is, it's called a liner lock because a piece of the liner on one side, a piece of the steel or in this case, titanium liner on the one side uh, is bent, cut and bent, so that when the blade is fully open, that bent piece, that cut bent piece of the liner, pops out behind the blade tang here and stops, stops that closing motion until you reach in, push it to the side, and bring it in. And how it stays in is a little ball bearing that's depressed into that bent a bit of a liner, that liner lock, uh, which fits into a little hole on the tang of the blade. So that little ball bearing that's wedged into this liner side, uh, this lock side, fits into a hole on the blade tang and keeps it closed. Now, a lot of the times you can shake it open, <clears throat> depending on how uh, highly, how high set that ball bearing is. Or, but in most cases, you need to break it with your thumb like that. You heard the little Emerson wheeze as I opened that. That'll go away with time. I don't use this knife too much, but it's a beauty. Thank you, Bill S. So there is the liner lock. It is a. Uh, it has a cousin. We're going to check out down the line here, but it is a piece of that liner underneath the handle that protrudes outward and uh, and interrupts the motion behind the tang. Uh, one note about the liner lock is that. Uh, it, it is not impeded by your grip. And by, by that, I mean, when you're opening it, 
that you have no worries of applying pressure to that lock and uh, and sort of impeding the opening um, through pressure of your finger, which isn't which can be an issue, and we're going to see that down the line. All right, so that is the liner lock. Next is one I almost forgot about, but it is kind of primitive, so I figured I'd put it up front, and that is the collar lock. This is an Opinel or Openel number 10 that I modified a little bit, and this is my favorite. Well, this is, this is my going out to dinner but not at a fancy place steak knife, and you open it. Well, this, this collar keeps it closed, so let's look at it. You can see the channel, the blade channel right here coming up through this bolster. Well, when you pivot this or turn this uh, collar pivot here, this piece of protruding steel interrupts the motion of the blade. So now all you do is you turn it, and now you pull the blade out, and then you turn this collar again. And as you can see, the motion is interrupted by this steel collar. So it's a pretty brilliant, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a pretty brilliant uh, and simple design there. And uh, it is really a, uh, um, it's a real open L signature. I mean, that's probably what we think of first when we think of open L, we think of the round beechwood handle painted that orange color. And then we think of that collar lock. That collar lock was adopted in the, what was it, the late 80s, early 90s by Cold Steel, uh, or no, no, I should say mid 90s to late 90s by Cold Steel on their, on one of their knives, uh, which now I think they called it the collar lock. Tell me down below. I know there's some Cold Steel nerd who's, who's now bristling at the fact that I called it the collar lock. I can't remember what they called it, but uh, a really cool uh, series of cold steel knives with different blade shapes that featured this lock with uh, with that sort of rubberized checkered handle. Um, so please let me know in the comments below. I do appreciate it. Uh, but this collar lock, I love it. Very, very strong. I mean, you know, it's, it, it's really strong. How are you going to get past that? I, I would venture to say it might even be stronger than the, uh, than the liner lock on which, uh, you know, off of which that blade could slip if it receives a lot of downward shock on the spine of the blade. Ooh, am I, am I creating controversy? I hope so. The next lock is the Axis lock. Now, that's a proprietary name, and we know it because Benchmade was the first company to come up with this, uh, this lock, and they called it the Axis lock. Now, the patent on this has run out. It's been, I guess it was 20 years, 25 years. It ran out a few years back, and all the other companies, almost all the other companies, realizing what an excellent design this is, uh, kind of jumped in and started making their own version of it. Uh, but I'm going to first show it off here with the classic, the Benchmade. This is my bug out with uh, Alan Putnam, uh, my car to scales, and the, and the Snaggletooth MF on there. But the star of the show right now is this axis lock. And you can see very plainly how it works. It's on... So it's a bar that goes from one side to the other, from one side of the handle to the other side, and it's attached to a spring. You can't see the spring uh, unless you take it apart, which is not fun. Uh, but the spring is called an omega spring, and it is literally shaped like an omega. It's a sort of almost full circle. It attaches to the frame, and then it attaches to the bar. And when you pull it, it compresses the spring this way. So that spring tension is always pushed forward against the tang of the blade here. See that? And when you pull it back, it releases, sorry about that. When you pull it back, it releases the blade and it can now turn. Also that forward pressure from the omega spring in the bar uh, seats the blade in a, in a notch, seats the, um, the blade notch in the bar there and keeps it closed as well. So this makes for a very fidget friendly knife. Uh, you can open it in a variety of ways. It flicks open easily. And then when you pull it back, it just drops shut. You can open it by pulling the lock back and flipping it out. I mean, this is probably the original fidget knife. 
It is very, very fidget friendly. Uh, so like I mentioned, the um, patent ran out on that knife on the uh, axis lock and then other companies jumped on, on with their versions of it. This is the SOG XR lock. It's also a, uh, it's the same concept here. They just have it uh, dressed up a little differently on the outside. It looks like a tab, but when you look inside, it's still on an Omega style spring and it's still, um, has that bar that interrupt that that seats into the back of the tang also my favorite version of this lock the hogue able lock able stands for an, an uh, ambidextrous bar lock enhanced so basically they're saying in four words we did the access lock but we did it better and actually i kind of think I mean, they did a great job. Let me just put it that way. I'm not going to take any sides here. Uh, but this is the Hogue Axis Bar Lock Enhanced. You can see it well illustrated here. There's the little notch. Or it's not a notch. That's actually dirt. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's that spring pressure and the angle of the tang and the uh, bar that hold it all together. Very strong lock. I'm going to place that down there. So next is a take on the liner lock. And this was created by Chris Reeve of Chris Reeve Knives. And yes, I'm talking about the Reeve integral lock or the frame lock. So you can see this is exactly what a uh, liner lock would look like on the inside. If you, if you popped off the scales and looked inside, it would look much like this, though the liner is much thinner than the frame here. And what this is, is a bent part of the frame. You got to take out, you got to mill out some pockets either on the outside or the inside of the lock side frame and then bend it in. And then the end of that frame lock, the end of that lock bar seats uh, right behind the flattened portion of the blade tang there and interrupts the motion. Now you can run into a lot of issues with uh, geometry right here. I know um, Strider Knives is notorious for having wonky geometry and new geometry and the old geometry and this and that. Uh, but you really have to pay attention to this interface here between the, the lock, uh, the lock bar and the blade tang. Most, uh, most if not all frame lock folders like this are made of titanium and you run into the issue of titanium being softer than uh, the blade steel, the hardened blade steel it comes up against. And, um, and that creates blade stick, which uh, was originally a feature, not a bug. But in past years, people have become not so thrilled with lock stick, right? Uh, really, in, in essence, lock stick ensures that lock is going to stay locked even more. <laughs> uh, but there are ways to do it without lock stick and that's what people prefer. So now you'll see a uh, hardened steel insert on the end of these titanium lock bars so that the connection is steel on steel. So this is probably, I don't know, uh, the, the most popular and most loved, maybe, maybe in, in competition with the axis style lock, um, probably the most loved lock these days. And something great about this uh, style is that when you squeeze it, when you hold the handle, you're just reinforcing that lock up with your own grip. So that is the Reeve integral lock or frame lock. And here with this Vero engineering synapse is a sort of um, other version of that called the bolster lock. And uh, you get kind of the, I don't know, the best of both worlds. You have a liner that comes forward and um, looks like a frame lock, kind of acts like a frame lock, also acts like a liner lock called a bolster lock. So I guess I would put this between the liner lock and the frame lock. It's called a bolster lock because your um, lock bar is mostly hidden and only presents itself in the bolster here. So you do not have any of the issues of with a, uh, with a frame lock, sometimes, especially if it's a flipper, when you're opening it, the pressure of just holding onto the knife that uh, comes from your fingers there can make it harder to open. Not with this knife in particular, but other knives. Uh, so this kind of solves that issue as well. So 
The bolster lock is a close cousin to both the liner lock and the frame lock, but I'm not calling it its own lock. All right, next is the button lock. Now the button lock, I only have in automatic versions, but that works just fine. The, in this case, the button is not only the knife actuator, but it's the lock. And it's sometimes called a plunge lock. Oh man, this was a bad example to show, <laughs> sorry. Uh, but really, um, it, because I have some other button locks where you can actually look down in there and see what's happening. Uh, but this, the button on the side of the handle is kept under spring tension, uh, pointing outward away from the handle. And the, and the pin under the button has two different widths. One that uh, will lock into a notch carved in the tang of the blade and then a thinner one. So when, when you push in the button, you're going from the, the fat dimension to the thinner dimension, which frees the blade from the pin there's that notch on the back of the tang, and then allows you to shut it. Now, on an automatic like this, it's all spring-loaded, coil spring-loaded, so it works the same in reverse and opens the knife. Yeah. I wanted to show this one because it's such a damn cool knife. This is this, uh, the Strider uh, SNG ProTech version, but I didn't think beforehand in, in that the locking mechanism is totally covered by this semi-integral handle. So sorry about that, uh, but just this is a good time to use your imagination or to pull your own button locks out and take a look inside. A very strong lock. I mean, these are all very strong locks, but uh, uh, I'm a big fan of that. And I'm liking that there are a lot of non-automatic button locks on the market now more and growing. And uh, a lot of them are from ProTech, masters of the button lock and the side opening automatics. Next is a lock proprietary to Spyderco. I haven't seen anyone else do this. And that is the compression lock. The compression lock is much like a, hmm, it's much like a liner lock. It's also a bit like a back lock in that, well, here, I'll, let me show you how you actuate it. So here, uh, if you've been living in a dark cave and have never seen one of these, uh, you press this tab on the back of the handle to close it. Um, but what it is, is a liner lock on the back side that as you open it and it engages the springy tension on that bent leaf spring, it pops that lock into a notch, another notch, another notch and tab design into the back of that, into the tang of that blade. Another ultra fidgety knife and also a very, very, very strong knife. You would have to crush that steel tab, somehow crush it. You would have to have so much pressure on the back of that spine. You would have to crush that tab to make this thing fail. The only other way you could make it fail is if you somehow uh, actuate it while you while using it. I just don't imagine uh, a use that would that would make that happen. I mean, because you have to be pretty conscious in unlocking this knife. This is also, like I said, a very very fidgety knife. Uh, maybe when I mentioned the Axis Lock as the original fidget knife, um, I'm sure the Compression Lock came to mind. Uh, but I think the Compression Lock came second uh, in terms of uh, when it was created. So the compression lock is an awesome, awesome uh, lock, not only for strength, but for fun. I'm gonna put that down here. A Couple more here. Uh, the last two that I'm really gonna talk about, then I have two others that, that are kind of also Rands. Uh, but the last two are Andrew Demko uh, creations, innovations, if you will. Uh, and this is seen, uh, this is the Scorpion lock which is seen on the AD-15. And in this case, the cold steel production version of the AD-15. This works by putting this uh, locking yoke, they call it, on the back of the knife. And the main star of the show here is this pin, this stop pin, look at how beefy that stop pin is, on the, on the top of the blade. Actually, that's not the stop pin, that is the locking pin. That's the stop pin right there. But when you lift up this lock, it comes out of this notch 
on the back of the blade. And you see how deep that notch is? Well, if you don't, it is quite deep if you're listening. Uh, but as, as the blade rotates, it's keeping constant contact with this locking pin on the tang. And as it rotates and reaches the notch, it falls deeply into that notch. Leaving room, you can see where the stop pin is and then where the uh, concentric half circle milled into the yoke is, leaving room to, with time and with use, bury itself deeper and deeper into the uh, into that notch. And that's kind of a theme with Demko's locks. Uh, with time and with use, they get more and more, they bury themselves deeper and deeper in the blade tangs and become kind of stronger and stronger and stronger with time, which is which is rare in the engineering world. Usually uh, something gets weaker and weaker and weaker with use. Well, this kind of gets stronger and stronger, mechanically anyway. Um, you know, materials can wear away and stuff like that. But I mean, really, we're talking about some pretty, pretty resilient and durable materials here. So this is a fidget friendly lock as well, because you just kind of open it, you can flip it out like that. And then you just wedge your finger between the frame and the lock and create space there. And then just with a flick of your wrist flips back in. So Fidgeting does have something, does have a role to play in these because, um, you know, uh, Greg Medford says a real man doesn't fidget with his knives. And, uh, you know, I, I have big respect for Greg Medford, but I will also respect respectfully say humans tend to fidget. And if you're going to fidget, you know, instead of bouncing your knee up and down or, or you know, flipping your pencil, why not flip a knife? Instead of those silly flit, fidget toys and all that, fidget with a knife and, uh, and because it'll be useful also. <laughs> so, you know, fidget is a factor. It also sells knives. Let's be real. Okay. Uh, last of the official knife locks is the most recent innovation by, um, by Demco. And that is the shark lock. And this is, I think it's his favorite lock. And I think it's my favorite lock of his uh, creation. And it works by pulling this tab back. It releases the blade, the blade drops. But yet again, we have a, a sort of self-correcting um, self -correcting lock here. Now, as you pull this back, this tab here is spring-loaded. There's a spring inside that is constantly compressed. And when you fight that compression, it releases the tang of the blade here from a downward protruding tab. So this thing is shaped like um, like a bar that has that widens at the end. Imagine this uh, shape that you can see on the outside, that lock shape mirrored on the bottom. So it kind of tilts down and that bottom surface that's mirroring this shape here presses against that blade tang. And the constant forward pressure of that compressed spring keeps it all in place. And again, uh, when holding it and pressing your thumb against the back of this lock, uh, which is one of the most comfortable ways to hold this, you are reinforcing that lock with your own strength, uh, something that you see also in the Scorpion lock. So just a great innovation and super fidgety. And this one sounds is evocative of the sound of a racking shotgun. So who doesn't love that? That's the shark lock. And man, are they just banging up the knife world with their production 80, 20.5 uh, with that. Um, the other also rands I want to talk about uh, real briefly. I'm not even sure how this magic works. I've looked at videos and such, but um, there is something locking this open. <laughs> this is a, and out the front, this is the um, Ultratech by, by Microtech, and it is locked open. Um, so there is a lock in there. There is a lock in the single um, action OTF, uh, which definitely bears investigation. I would look, I'm not taking mine apart. Um, so I've looked at a few videos and I kind of get it. Uh, but if you want to know more, uh, I think Nick Shabazz has a good one. I think, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, 
Birdshot IV has uh, a video on that. There are a couple of good videos where people have the guts to take apart their OTFs and look at how they work. So I would look there, but I'm just kind of letting you know that that is also a locking knife. Also a locking knife is this. There, I'm going to do it here. The Bally Song locks open, and it's so simple. It's just, uh, in many cases, a pin. Uh, in this, it's two stop pins here and here on either side of the handle that fit in that notch. And then when you close it, it's pressure. It's just simple pressure from both sides of these uh, two handles that keep this knife open. Older ones, maybe cheaper ones, have a single stop pin in the center that they both kind of bend around. In this case, and in higher end uh, Bally songs, you have two stop pins, one on each handle, and they fit into corresponding notches on the back of the blade tang. Uh, but that also is a locked open knife. So I figured it bared mentioning here, um, not very complex. You know, it's kind of the, the inverse of the shark lock, which is somewhat, you know, complex, at least in that it took a lot of imagination and engineering to come up with that design. Uh, and this is a, a bit more primitive, but man, it'll do the trick, right? It will lock that blade open. So there you have it. It's my survey of folding knife lock, uh, locking mechanisms and lock types. Uh, where would we be without locking knives? I remember talking to Zelric, uh, 42, you know him as, well, you know him as Zelric, but Terrell Todd, and I asked him if he was into slip joint knives, and he's like, no, um, we've come up with this thing called the blade lock in the last, you know, 150 years, and uh, I prefer to lock my blades open, and I thought that was a uh, kind of a snarky thing to say, <laughs> but I appreciated it. Uh, where would we be without the locking knife? We would be with either fixed blades that we knew, knew weren't going to shut on our hands, or we would have uh, just the, uh, the, the traditional spring back um, uh, slip joint knives, which are great, but you know, if you want something small and foldable, but stout as hell, that's not going to close on you, you need one of these kind of modern blades. So I wanted to run through them. Make sure that you check out episode 234 coming up on Sunday with John Demko. We were talking about Demko knives and and uh, Andrew Demko's creations. Well, John Demko is the man and the brother uh, of Andrew Demko who helps run the company. Really, he's kind of the business, the business mind. And man, have they been taken off, especially since uh, Cold Steel has been sold and Andrew Demko is no longer with them. Um, John Demko was the guy who was really kind of strategizing forward for how Demko knives would proceed once they were um, out on their own. And man, have they been knocking it out of the park with that 80, 20.5. We have a great conversation and uh, he's an, he's an awesome guy to talk to. Uh, but before you get to that, make sure that you also listen to, to our conversation with Peter Carey, uh, a real character, a real great guy. And, uh, you know, just a maker of some of the most premium tactical folders on the market. They are beautiful and they are to me unobtainium, but who knows? Maybe, maybe someday I'll, I'll happen upon a Peter Carey folding knife. Be sure that you like, comment, subscribe, uh, not only check in with our next midweek supplemental, check out, check out our Sunday interview shows and, uh, you know, hear from the people who make this knife world happen. Also join us on YouTube, Facebook, or Twitch for Thursday night knives every Thursday night, 10 PM Eastern standard time and join the conversation. Also, I do close up videos and, uh, check those out as well. Also, if you like Instagram, check out Instagram. I love it. I mean, I think it's one of the best places for knives because it's all visual. And uh, we do updates there, not only of what I'm carrying and what I'm interested in, but who the, uh, who the interview of the week is on the podcast. So check us out on Instagram as well. So for Jim, working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob uh, saying thanks for watching, thanks for listening. And until next week, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. 
For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. (laughs) 